Hey guys, it's Sister Rack, and I'm back with the first Patreon video of 2018. Um, today I wanted to talk a lot about uh, what to do with lines after you've sketched them uh, in order to render them. So I always recommend that you find the most uh, essential lines to trace on your reference, though I don't practice tracing, I feel like I don't need it. Um, I can eyeball pretty much, pretty accurately, but I do sometimes feel like I'm missing out on something I don't notice till the day after that I eyeballed. So in this painting, what I did was I set up a really good plate of values designating shadows for the eye socket, but these are not values that characterize. They are not face specific. They could be a woman or a man. They could be old or young. Uh, not young, because young would be a little bit shorter. And what you do if you want characterization right away or like a specific kind of face, what you do is sketch. Um, or you can just, you know, render until it looks like something. But I, again, I wanted a very specific kind of face and I didn't want to risk losing the characterization and just rendering freehand. Um, so what I'm doing here is I am showing you how I'm sketching but and adding characterization, but at the same time, I'm using lines, which are, you know, big taboo. The problem with lines is that they're not bad, they're just overused. So you can't really blame the line and reject the line forever. It's that students use lines to replace edges in their painting where there should only be edges. There are no lines in real life. Uh, so what do we do with lines that we use to prep a painting? <clears throat> what I do, as you can see here, I started smudging away at the lines, making them behave like the plate for the incoming blocking of the values, um, but they're no longer actually sharp lines. The problem with a line is that it's too much read immediately. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying very hard to preserve the line because it's providing me with a characterization quality that I'd lose if I never tried sketching in the first place. But I am replacing the lines with their designated edge per area, so a larger, thicker line for the lash lines. Um, shadows near their side of the nose depend without value sharing, of course. Um, and I'm using these lines as guides for my edges, and that's it. It's easier said than done, of course, just you know, not getting rid of your lines um, wholly and using them as guides for edges. That's very easy to say, it's an easy concept. But when you're in the thick of it and you're painting, it's hard to know exactly when to do this. Um, so the rule of thumb is that the eye can get away with a lot of line work. Um, so I thicken the lines around the eyes. The eyes have lots of you know, lashes or in a line formation. Eyebrows tend to have sparse hairs that are very lion-like. The crease of the eyes, of the upper and lower eyes, uh, eyelids sometimes um, have a line. So what happens is you tend to get away with using lines around the eyes. But how about the nose? You can't use a line for the nostrils. You, you, after you place in the nostril cavities as part of the six dark spots, you have to use edges around the nostrils. So I kept those lines light enough that I'm going to be painting them away and turning them into an edge very soon. So at this stage, the lines have stayed pretty rough and uh, I'll be replacing them soon with blocking values. All of the lines are not extreme detailing. None of the lines had detailing in them. So if you're using guiding lines and you're detailing with them, you're doing the exact opposite of what you're supposed to be doing guiding lines or sketch lines, whatever you want to call them, guide your blocks, which, which means they have a relationship with your blocks and only have a role to play in the early stages of the painting. Lines have no business in the later stages of the painting because those are where contrast and detail and sh uh, brush shrinking happens. Um, so at this stage, um, again, the only place you really get away with a line formation type anatomy is the lash line um, or the uh, socket line. Um, but that's after you set up a good radial descent for the eye socket. That's after you um, you make sure that the eye, eye kind of lash line around the eye is one big system of shadows and cast shadows and eyelids and all that business. And you make sure to represent the lashes with a texture and not actually draw every individual lash, especially especially on male characters. Um, you never want to try doing that on a, on a male character. You're really going to throw off the, 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 the gender. <clears throat> so here I'm really liking what I'm seeing. As you can see, I delay the pupil uh, and the iris, and uh, I do that on purpose because I'm trying to make sure I have the squint right, the spherical shape of the eye right. I did take care of a lot of that with my sketch lines, um, but I feel like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't kind of get enough of that. It was still just sketch lines. I still didn't have a painting yet. It was not a painting. 
um, it was still very, very early. It was like uh, uh, I would never be able to know whether or not I had enough squint until I painted it in. When you add and flesh something out, it gets a whole new potential, like a whole new array of mistakes that could be made um, that could completely throw off. Don't trust only your first sketch lines to be um, the guides that you, that, that or, or the characterization, all the characterization that you'll need. There is characterization to be added uh, in the rendering stage. Of course, using lines and guidelines helps set you off, helps start you off. Um, but uh, I really wanted to focus on characterization and um, delay the pupils as far as long as possible. Uh, the iris, sorry, because I, again, I feel like I didn't have enough characterization yet. I hate painting in the pupil and then have to paint around it like I'm, you know, painting around eggshells, I guess. I didn't want it to make mistakes. I wanted to experiment with the squint. I wanted to set the gaze right and the eyebrows right, lowering them, raising them, um, uh, making sure the nostrils were the right width with the eyes. If I had to adjust the eyes, if I kept adjusting the eyes and I had pupils set in, I would throw off the gaze. Uh, so the gaze is, is something really, really important to me. It's something that uh, a lot of people compliment my work with uh, because there, it's such a strong gaze. I really try to capture the real, realistic essence of a gaze uh, when someone's eyes are locked um, into some something in a distance uh, or something close up even. And that's the squint, how close I put the pupils to each other. Um, the closer they get, the more focused the character. Don't make them too focused, of course, then they'll look cross-eyed. Um, but, uh, but, but delaying them really, really is why I feel I had success in this painting and that that gaze was so captivating. I was really well received on Instagram and I feel it was because of that realistic gaze and I would not have established that if I hadn't a good plate. And of course, I wouldn't know what to do with my blocking brush if I didn't use my lines right. So again, your lines are obsolete. They are used, they're, they are replaced with edges eventually. You get away with some of them in their raw state. None of my lines here are in their original state um, at all. They all got painted away, replaced with an edge or a large brush stroke. They are guides. Uh, and the more planning you do, the more guides you have. So in essence, lines are part of the planning. They're part of the blueprinting. They are one tool used for blueprinting. Another line tool that is used for blueprinting is the horizontal, uh, I mean the vertical line, the symmetry line of the face. Um, I have that projected all the time. I, I have that in my mind. I used it so many times, I can't shake it off, so I see it in my mind's eye constantly. But because you're a beginner, because you're intermediate, or you're still working, um, I recommend you use that guiding line the vertical line, please, please use it. The horizontal lines I definitely used. Um, and by use it, I don't mean, I mean, sometimes I sketch it in in the early stages and I, and I paint it away. Uh, but, uh, but by use it for you, I mean have it in a separate layer turned on always. Uh, make sure not to drop tool selected. But you shouldn't be really sketching with using the eyedropper tool anyway. You should be smudging. We've established that with the previous videos that I posted for 2017. Smudging is the way to go. Make sure you smudge after you've spent enough time blocking. And if you join my streams, you'll know I always complain about the blocking layer, how it's a stage, how it's always the most difficult. It's the most trying. It has the most mistake. It is the most mistake prone. It is where the character <clears throat> is really decided where the idea of the character is decided. And portraiture being such a difficult craft, I I, I, I really, really have a hard time with blocking in. And you know, just because I'm a teacher doesn't mean I don't have, uh, I'm not prone to mistakes, I'm very prone to mistakes. Every paint brush that you set in isn't going to be the right one for that moment. You're gonna make ton, like, like let's say you make one really good brush stroke in the early stages. You're gonna make four more really bad ones and you're gonna spend the next 10 ones after those four correcting those four. And then you're gonna make one really good progressive brush stroke, maybe another one, maybe another one. So it's one mistake that you fix after another and eventually you reorganize brush strokes until they look good. Um, and uh, the blocking stage is where you can do that freely without the danger of detail without the danger of over-representing your work or, or, or trying to over-represent too much early in your work. Um, by over-representing work, I mean confusing your you know study with some other aspects, like uh, trying to characterize too early with detailing, so adding a scar or adding something irrelevant like that. You're not really, the characterization is the nuance of the features and their scales and their types and whether or not it's male or female, whether or not the eye is downturned or almond shape, um, that's characterization for me. Characterization isn't 
all about adding in an earring and throwing in an eye patch. That's that's beginner stuff. That's it's not just beginner stuff. It's cliche. It's icky. We don't really try to do that with portraiture. We only paint the face, um, and maybe sometimes we couple it with it with a good gesture. Um, and that's because we're studying specifically the face's capability to characterize its face, its itself. Um, so please remember that it's not about uh, preserving your lines, it's about using your lines to characterize early to get, to get the ball rolling with the characterization uh, and know what to do with your blocks. <clears throat> For this character specifically, I really wanted to capture that big brown eyed gaze. Um, I, I also didn't want that typical beautiful face, that typical pretty boy. Uh, I wanted a little bit more ruggedness or handsomeness to it. And uh, the thicker, flat brow of the, of the male, coupled with a slight, slight downward turn in the almond-shaped eye. Uh, all of that is just stuff I love experimenting with, especially for male faces. I lower the eyebrows eventually as well, and that added an even more deeper set shadow, which adds to that mystery and adds to the intensity of the gaze. As I said, the gaze is a combination of focusing the eyes and the eyebrows and the squint of the eye, which is, again, all stuff. The squint and the eyebrows are stuff you decide on early on in the painting. Um, some weird texturing distortion happened in the painting. I'm not sure why that happened. Um, I guess it's just when I dropped it into Premiere. Um, I didn't have this weird noise problem in the picture you see on the side. Um, that just must be how, how uh, Premiere is interpreting the, my JPEG. Uh, but on Instagram, you can probably see it in its original state. It looks much better than this weird pixelated version. I'm not even sure if it'll render with that. Um, I won't be able to know until I render it. Um, so here, after everything is set up, I love it. Everything is good. I love what's going on with the face. As you can see, I always under, uh, like, rendered lips, and nobody notices. Nobody cares. Can anyone, you know, people could care less because it's not about the lips. It's about the eyes. That's a style I want to move forward uh, with. As you can see, breaking the rules doesn't necessarily mean you're breaking anything. It's just I'm not rendering. It's not really breaking any rule. I just refuse to render anything that isn't the eyes um, or directly close to the eyes. Uh, so the nose is okay because there's a lot of edge work around it, but I'm not using any small brush strokes around the nose as you can see. Uh, compared to the wrinkles of the eyelids, I'm not using any around the nose, just the edge work around the nostrils and the edge of the nostril cavity. Um, after adding in the eye socket, not the eye socket, uh, the eye bags, I feel like he gained that age and believability. A lot of you forget to fill in that space between the eyes and the nose. Um, and that is really imperative that you fill it up or else all your characters will look airbrushed and photoshopped and it just won't look good. It'll look too clean. Uh, but that's it. That's really all that went into painting this. You saw the whole process. Nothing specific, just knowing when to use which brush. Uh, using the soft brush is always a tricky thing and always be careful with your soft brush. You want to use it to represent the general miasma of shadow in an area caused by a gradually descending depression. Um, it's like a fog or, or, or like, a, you know, like, a, like an air of shadow around an area. That usually happens a lot around um, uh, things that cast a shadow that are textured in nature. So eyelashes casting a shadow have a fuzzy edge because there's just so many little hairs it looks like fur. Or eyebrows casting a shadow also cast a shadow that's very soft. Uh, they, don't have, they don't cast a defined geometric shadow that can be very straight um, and very sharp and very clean. Um, so that's really it. I, I hope you guys learned something from this and I hope you apply it to your work. See you guys next month. Thank you for watching. Bye.